Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Trollheim. I'm your host, Rabbi Anibal Mas. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here once again, so we can take a little bit of our afternoon to study Torah. In this case, we've been studying Pirkei Avot since Passover as a preparation for Shavuot. Shavuot is this weekend, so technically this is the last class that we have to study Pirkei Avot. But guys, if you want, we can continue because I did all this research. I still have more, more topics to do. So if you want to continue for a little longer with Pirkei Avot, we can do that. Just let me know. You can type it in the chat. Or here is my email in, in the corner. Let me know if you want to continue a little longer with Pirkei Avot. Otherwise, we will go back to study the weekly Parsha. See, very democratic. I will give you, my students, the power to decide what we are going to do next. But first, let's see who is here today. Uh, Priscilla Kerr, she was the first one, actually, even... Uh, as soon as I trigger the the timer, she say hello, welcome Priscilla. Uh, Judy Shorak is here, nice and early. Randy Lodinger, shalom to you. Josue Selva. Uh, <laughs> let's see, welcome. It said I've been setting up the project for the tilapia, tilapia the fish. You know, guys. It said it's a. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the the tilapia, tilapia for the world coming all the way from uh, Josue Selva. Uh, Ruven is here. Shalom, Andrea Royave. Welcome to the class. <laughs> Judge Rocky Pollack says democratic curriculum. Okay, yeah, democratic curriculum, but uh, nobody votes. Nobody votes, just like uh, the democracy in many countries. We give people the choice, but they don't vote. Anyway, Karen Farkas is here. Shalom and welcome. And Andrea Royave, you miss tilapia. Well, you have tilapia in the supermarket, you know, here in Winnipeg. It's uh, I don't know. I'm more of I'm more of like a like more of a salmon guy. I like the the, 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 the I don't know the meaty meatiness of of the salmon. I have a very good recipe to cook it. I do it all the time. In fact. I'm going to cook myself a piece of salmon right after the class is over. Oh yeah, it's not fresh. Well, it's difficult to find it fresh unless you live in the coast and you can just get it and and cook it. Like many people do here in the lakes, we have uh, some uh, pickerel, for example. You can get it and cook it right away here in Manitoba or Goldeye. But other than that, yeah. It's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, yeah. Okay. So today is class number six for Pirkei Avot. And as I mentioned, this weekend is going to be Shavuot. So I wanted to do something that it will prepare us a little bit better for Shavuot, for which is the, the anniversary of the revelation of the Torah. At least that's what we what believe. Uh, we have... A special activity here in Winnipeg. Shari Zedek is partnering with Temple Shalom. And we are going to have a panel discussion. It will be myself and Rabbi Alan Finkel from Temple Shalom. And we are going to talk about our understanding of Revelation and all the challenges that the... How can I say this in a nice way? The traditional the official narrative, let's put it that way, all the challenges that the official narrative of Revelation as presented in the Torah or as presented in the Talmud, uh, all the challenges that they present to us. So sometimes there are certain things that need clarification and we are going to explain what we believe, uh, among other things. It's going to be a very short presentation and then we are going to answer uh, questions that people may have. So, basically, the way it's going to work is this Sunday, this Sunday, at 2 p.m. Central Time, uh, we're going to stream it, if you are not in Winnipeg, but if you're in Winnipeg, you are invited to come to Temple Shalom. We're going to do it there. We're going to have the opportunity uh, for people to attend. If you are uh, vaccinated and you, know, you, you, you don't care wearing a mask during the event, please, by all means, 
come by, we would love to see you there. Otherwise, if you want to stay home uh, or you're not in town, you will have the chance as well to stream it. There, there will be there, there is more information on our website. Is it winnipeg.ca? Check it there. You will have all the information you need for that. And because we're going to be talking about the revelation, I wanted to give you today a little bit of an introduction to the concept of revelation of Torah. But today I wanted to center more in the revelation of the oral Torah. That is more what I'm going to talk about this weekend. Rabbi Finkel is going to talk is going to center on the revelation revelation of the written Torah. In other words, the Torah that we read every every week in the synagogue. You know, when you go and you see the scroll, that's what we call the written Torah. Uh, <laughs> Josue Selva, I'm vaccinated. <laughs> She's still, I attend virtually. Okay, but it, that's what I mean. People who are not in town. Okay, people who are not in town. So, yeah, you can invite the tilapias to come as well. So, yeah. I wanted to talk about that. And uh, to help us understand a little bit more the concept of revelation, I want to talk a little bit about Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, verse 1. It means the very, very first Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, that is the one that opens up the book talking about the revelation and what happened right after revelation. Okay? So without further ado, let me present to you the material that I have for you today. And I put the title Judging Others because th that's going to be uh, one of the, the, the main topics after we analyze a little bit of this thing of the Revelation. So let's read it. It says, Moshe kibel Torah mi Sinai. Okay? This is presented as a... How can I say this? You know, when you say... Uh, as a statement. This is presented as a statement, as a theological statement. One of these, I believe... I believe in this, I believe in that, I believe in this. Okay? So this is the way it's presented, this mission. It says, I believe that Moshe, Moses, received the Torah from Sinai, okay, and transmitted it to Yehoshua, to Joshua. And Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. Who were the men of the Great Assembly? Don't worry, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So, they, who is they? All of the above. They said three things. Be deliberate in judgment. Raise up many disciples. And make a fence for the Torah. So we're going to talk about these three things as well today. What does it mean? Be deliberate in judgments. So that's what I call it, judging others, right? The, the class for today. Raise up many students, many disciples. We're going to talk about that as well. And make a fence for the Torah. Hopefully we're going, to ha we're going to have enough time to talk about that thing too. It's a big thing, big thing about uh, certain people's disappointment with Judaism because of that statement, because of the statement of make a fence for the Torah and how that was used and abused during the ages to make some parts of or some aspects of Judaism very difficult to observe or to keep. Okay. So what do we learn from here? Well, uh, the rabbis understand this as talking not just the written Torah, because otherwise, why do you need to explain all this chain from Moses to Joshua to the elders to the prophet to the men of the great assembly? If we are talking about if you're talking about the, the physical Torah, the written Torah, this description doesn't make any sense because of course it will go from one generation to the next. So the rabbis understand that this Mishnah is talking specifically about the explanations to the Torah that they, they were given orally from God to Moses. The problem is that it's not written anywhere in the Torah. Nowhere in the Torah says that God actually uh, gave any kind of oral explanation about the written Torah. And that's a big thing. And it's part of the belief that we have as rabbinic Jews, that that actually happened. And then it makes sense when you say, yeah, God gave 
all that information on top of the written tour. Okay? As a uh, as a uh, how you call it in addition in addition to the written tour. So all that information then it makes sense. I said Moses actually took the time to teach all that word by word to Joshua. Joshua was a very good student, so he paid attention and he absorbed all that. And then Joshua, at the same time, had to teach all that information into the next generation. Who were the next generations? The elders. Which means that Joshua didn't teach this to everybody. He didn't open a school, whoever wants to learn Torah, come and study with me. Nope. Nope. According to Mishnah, Joshua actually kept that oral information just for the elders. Written Torah, accessible for everybody. Oral Torah, only a selected group. Okay? So to the elders. So which, by the way, they became the first rabbis. The ones who were responsible for keeping all that information. Those were the rabbis. But again, the need or the commandment to have rabbis, not in the Torah. Not in the Torah. It's not mentioned anywhere. So then the elders taught the prophets, the prophets that you read in the Bible, those learn from the elders who learned from Joshua. And then the prophets at, at the same at, at, at their time taught all that to the men of the great assembly. That it was the first uh, group of rabbis that they got together to legislate and to make Judaism applicable to real life in the kingdoms of Israel, okay? So, here, and then he said, they say three things, be deliberate in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make offense for the Torah. It's not that this is the only thing they said. And we are going to see later, so these are main categories of everything they taught, okay? So, let's study a little bit before we continue with something that, to me, is the most important of all the thing. And it's trying to understand the, the mission or the, of the men of the great assembly. Because there is here uh, a misunderstanding sometimes that, or a controversy, a controversy about the oral law, what in these days we call the Talmud, okay? That uh, some people believe that the Talmud is not really something that it was giving orally from God to Moses, but actually, the actual content of the Talmud is the uh, evolution, if you want, or an attempt to preserve the rulings of the men of the great assembly. Because if you go and you read the Talmud, you will always say that Rabbi so-and-so said in the name of Rabbi so-and-so, and sometimes this in the name of God for three generations. So we said, Rabbi so-and-so say in the name of Rabbi so-and-so who learned from so-and-so. But that's it. He never continues all the way up to uh, Moses, let's say. Right? It's always a couple of generations back. So w when we say that all this oral law came from God and Sinai, it was a decision made by the rabbis that they decided that this is what it is and this is where it's coming from. If you want to know more about that, you have to come on Sunday because that's what I'm going to talk about. Alternative theories of why we have the oral law. But one and is the, the most interesting to me and is the one that it doesn't diminish anything, it doesn't change a thing about the way we observe Judaism, is to say that these are the rulings of the men of the great assembly. It's not less done. It's still important because it was decided by the body of Jewish law at the time. And it was a unified one. It's not like in these days that you have rabbis all over the map scattered everywhere. Every rabbi making a different decision and there is no unified decisions. Back in the day, this is impressive. There was one body of rabbis, one, and they made decisions. And it's amazing. It's amazing that that happened. It's amazing that that happened, and that is what somehow became the, uh, the, the oral law and the Talmud, eventually. Okay, So, 
Who were the men of the great assemblies? Before we do that, I have comments here. I don't want to miss it. I want to miss a bit. Priscilla, you say, let's see. They said, all this content of the Torah all written. Moses wrote after he came down or he wrote it when he was there with a shame, curiosity. No, no, no. The, the Torah was written during Moses' life. The information, uh, that's a different thing. All, all the written Torah, the official narrative is that uh, Moses had the tent of the meeting. It was almost like a phone booth, if you want. Like he will go to talk to God and God will dictate. And that's when Moses will write the Torah. And that happened for the first year and a bit after they left Egypt. When they, uh, when the people of Israel failed to enter the promised land, remember the episode of the spice? They came back, said it's impossible. Then God said, 40 years in the desert, everybody's going to die. During those 40 years, there was no communication from God to Moses. That was one of the things that sometimes we forget. Okay? Uh, and basically, again, official narrative is when God was dictating to Moses in, in the tent of the meeting, God was also explaining Moses verse by verse how to apply it. Uh, and will teach Moses about exceptions and contradictions and all that. Okay? Uh, and Josue Selva, you say, we are not the prophets. We're not the prophet who goes the first connection with Hashem rather than the elders. No, no, this is nothing to do with connection with God. We are talking about uh, learning from Moses or learning from Joshua. Nothing to do with connection with God, okay? Don't confuse because the connection that God had with the prophets was never to teach them law. It was always to remind them the law so they will remind the Jewish people the law so they will not deviate from the law. That's what the prophets were sent. God said, look, the people of Israel is misunderstanding or misapplying the law. So God, ne God never revealed anything new after Sinai. It was always a reminder. Okay? Uh, hi, Molly. Welcome to the class. Molly Fan is here. Okay, so let's read about this. The men of the great assembly... And we are talking about here approximately uh, from the year 410 to 310 BCE, okay? Before the Common Era. So we are talking about like uh, uh, 2,400 years ago, okay? So you can have a better picture of what we are talking about. We're a group of 120 elders, including the last surviving prophets, and the greatest Torah scholars of the generation. Clear? Okay. Among them were Ezra, Zerubbabel, Mordechai. Uh, yeah, the one from Purim, Mordechai. He was a scholar. He was a rabbi. Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Remember, this Malachi is the prophets. They survived at the time of Ezra when the Jews returned to Israel from Babylonia at the beginning of the Second Temple era. These are the ones who witnessed the rebuilding of the temple and then reorganized Jewish life. Among the development in Judaism that they are attributed to them are the fixing of the Jewish biblical canon. So have you ever wondered why we have the books we have in the Bible and not others? I will give you an example. Uh, on Hanukkah, we read about the Maccabees. We know who they are, but we don't read the book of Maccabees, that it is part of the Old Testament of Catholic Bibles. Because it, they, the book of Maccabees did not make the cut to be part of the Jewish biblical canon. Who decided that? Rabbis of this era. Okay, we believe, we believe that they were the men of the great assembly. The problem is that we don't really have uh, archaeological support that the men of the great assembly actually existed the way it is described. Uh, there is a little bit of faith component there that this happened this way. That was the way it was passed to us that there were 120 elders, some of them were prophets and we take it that way but we know that there was a, that there actually was a body of Jewish law at the time. By the way, that's why the 120 elders that's why we have the 120 members in the parliament in Israel. Okay? 
Uh, so again, what they did, they fixed the Bible, including the book of Ezekiel, Daniel, Esther, and the 12 minor prophets. They introduced the Feast of Purim, okay? And the institution of the prayer known as the Amidah, as well as other synagogues, uh, synagogal pray prayers, rituals, and benedictions. Okay, very important. So lots of th these guys, they got together and then decided many things. Uh, and many new things as well. And we, what we have to understand is when the Israelites came back from Babylonia, there was a mix of practices that they also came from the north. The north, they used to have a temple that it was uh, not the temple in Jerusalem. It was a different one. And they developed uh, a new religion loosely based on Judaism. And there are some theories that some of those practices actually permeated to the south and eventually became Jewish practices. Nobody knew why they were doing it. So why do we do this? Ah, or a law. It may have come from God orally and we didn't, we didn't know that. So there's a lot of that. Come on Sunday. You will hear more, more about this. Okay, so this is a quick introduction to the men of the great assembly. Uh, let's continue a little more about this. Is said, why they were called men of the great assembly? So the Talmud explains that the greatness lay in their ability to perceive God's greatness, even in times of exile and the apparent eclipse of his glory. Whereas others felt with justification that God could not be praised fully in an era when his people were subjugated and his temple has been desecrated, this man saw and proclaimed his greatness even then, and this lay their greatness. You have to understand that these people, even if they were not 120 or maybe the names were a little, it doesn't matter what they did, brought a lot of hope to the Jewish people. They brought a new way to experience Judaism. Remember, this started in Babylonia when they did not have the temple, and they but they still needed to find a way to connect with God. How do we do that now that we cannot sacrifice? Well, let's work. Let's create something. Because in the Torah, there is not plan B, in the written Torah. So this is the one, some of the great things they did. They reshaped the way we experience Judaism. After the Babylonian exile, the men of the Great Assembly realized that with the end of the prophetic era, there was a vacuum in Torah leadership, and they stepped into the breach. They assumed the helm and instituted many enactments to ensure compliance with the Torah. The last surviving member of the Great Assembly was Shimon HaTzadik, that's his grave, right there. Right there. The photo that I added for you today is the grave of Shimon HaTzadik, Simon the Righteous. It's right there. It's in Israel. You can go and visit. Okay? So, uh, any questions, please type it in the chat. I will be happy to answer if I can. Okay? Otherwise, let's continue. Another, another thing about this group the men of the Great Assembly said many things on a wide variety of subject of Torah knowledge and of life generally. Nevertheless, the Mishnah sums up their legacy to Israel in the three lessons stated here. Remember? What were the three? Let's see if you were paying attention. About judgments, students, and defense around the Torah, okay? Good, I hope you remember that. So, uh, three lessons. In Avot, in Pirkei Avot, the words they said, or they used to say, appear constantly. They always signify that the lesson or inst instruction recorded was central to the life of the person of persons being quoted. Thus, the lessons of Avot are essentially the distillations of the life and teachings of the great personage who appear on its pages. That's why I always, want, you know, when I present a Mishnah for you from Pirkei Avot, I try to present a little bio 
of the rabbi who said it because sometimes it's sometimes it's more easier than others sometimes you can actually see how whatever they say had something to do with the way they experience life something happened to them or they did something or they learned something or they have certain lifestyle that made them said say what they said okay that's that's why i like to do that okay uh it is Far easier to speak for 40 minutes on a subject than to compact the same message in a 10-minute talk, right? But the 10-minute talk is more effective and would be better and longer Remember, Part of the genius of a vote is its ability to reduce sophisticated, philosophical, complex issues and solutions into concise, easily remembered nuggets of wisdom. I love that because this is something about Pirkei Avot as well that sometimes we forget. There is something that you read one Mishnah and it has so much wisdom encapsulated there that it's uh, that's what it makes it so effective and that's why it's so widely studied. You don't need much uh, explanation to understand pretty much what the rabbis are saying here. Okay, so let's go back to the statement now that we I presented a little bit of historic and context of what they said. Um, these three teachings about judging students and fans to the Torah. Uh, it, it's very interesting that, for example, this Midrash, Midrash Muel, say it. They are referring to separately two. So statement, statement number one about judging others. Who said it? Joshua. Second statement about creating students, the elders. And the third statement about the fences around the Torah, the prophets. Okay? So one of the following statements are uh, attributed to each group. That's the way the, the, the Midrash understand Pirkei Avot chapter 1, verse 1. So, let's study a little bit about the first part. B deliberate in judgment i know we have judge Pollock here i hope you can uh, uh comment about this this is your uh your area of expertise so be deliberate in judgment this admonition is addressed oh karen farka the fences are the most problematic for me okay so yeah for everybody but just uh be patient we're going to we are going to study that one uh, so this admonition is addressed to judges. Okay, that's according to this rabbi, right? Moshe Lieber. Even if a similar case has come before a judge two or three times in the past, he should not be hasty to equate the cases. Rather, he should deliberate before issuing a ruling. Okay, so this is explanation number one. I will say this is the most logical one. Uh, this is the one that goes to the literal... Uh, meaning of the text be deliberate in judgment mishnah is talking to the judges good piece of good piece of advice if you ask me nothing wrong to remind the judges once in a while that they have to be careful right uh but because this happened in every area uh I, I remember many years ago like 20 years ago when i came to winnipeg okay i came here with uh driver license from Chile, the last country that I was living. And then that driver license is good for three months or so. But then you have to get a new one from Manitoba, the province. We are here. So Winnipeg is, for all of you out of towners or in another country, the city of Winnipeg is in the province of Manitoba. Okay. So I have to do it. So you have to read a book, uh, which is very interesting, about all the theory about driving in Manitoba. And one of the things that I remember, there was one paragraph talking about being careful, being careful when you drive. Uh, and the funny thing is that according to the statistics, most car accidents happens with experienced, experienced drivers, drivers that they have lots of experience. It's very rare to see uh, new drivers 
getting involved in accidents. Why? Because they pay more attention of everything they do. They are more cautious. They don't speed. But then we get this sense of false confidence that, hey, we are experts and that's when we start making mistakes because we get sloppy. Ah, I can drive and drink and text and play music and everything at the same time. But it's not necessarily the case. So you see, it's good to say be deliberate in judgment is oriented to the judges. But then I was thinking, you know, how many, if this is just for judges, so it's so limited. Be careful, this would be for, I don't know, I don't know if you, Rocky, can tell me, uh, can tell me what, what percentage of the population is a judge. <laughs> and within that, how, what percentage of the Jewish population? It's a judge. So that, that this Mishnah, this Mishnah is for just like a nothing percent. The Jewish people not so practical. So let's see, uh, Rocky, what do you say here? You say good advice. Don't use a prayer ruling as a shorthand reason for a decision because not two fact situations are identical. Yeah, yeah. You see, it's a it's a good advice, but very limited. Very, very, very limited. So uh, that's why. Avod the Ravinatan, which is a collection of Midrashim, will say, no, 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 not so fast. This principle applies to all people. All people. For each of us is a judge who must evaluate people and situations. In all matters, one should act deliberately rather than in haste. Isn't that true? Isn't that what we do all the time? When you make a decision, any decision in life, any decision, even what we are going to have for breakfast or for lunch, you are evaluating different variables. And then you make a decision. Sometimes we don't even think about it. But we are, of course, you know, quote unquote, judges for everything we do. So then this Mishnah all of a sudden is talking about daily life. I said, look, you have to make many decisions in your life. So just be careful. Don't think because you've been making decisions since the, the day you were born. Uh, you don't have to think more, learn more, and practice more. It's a, yeah. Uh, welcome, Denise. Welcome to the class. And Rocky, why you say here? Let me see, let me see. That's assuming you have freedom of choice. Oh. Well, I will say that in Judaism, freedom of choice is a, one of, it's a principle. It's a principle. But that's why we have uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to repent for what we have done. Because without freedom of choice, the high holidays don't make any sense. What do you have to repent if you don't have a choice? So that's why I said that uh, it's one of the uh, pillars of Judaism. They, they believe uh, they believe in freedom of choice. Hold on a minute, guys. Okay, so let's continue. Because here, uh, what? let's see what the Rambam now has to say. He says, one who has uh, irrever uh, irre irreverently in deciding the law and is quick to hand down a ruling before thoroughly investigating the issue until it is clear as day. And again, judges, professional judges and regular people, it's talking for everybody who needs to make a decision, especially a major decision, okay? So whoever doesn't go through this process is, uh, is considered a fool, a wicked person and an arrogant one, okay? It's interesting that uh, wicked and arrogant and on top of that, a fool. This is what the sages commanded, be deliberate in judgment. So you have to understand again uh, a little bit about the Rambam. He was a rationalist. He thought that 
we came to this world with uh, like a great gift, which is our brain. And then you, when you get a gift, they say, why won't you use it? <laughs> why the, why, you, you have all these tools to make better decisions. They are there for you. Use them. So if you, if you have something that is very valuable and you don't use it, and then you make mistakes because you didn't use it, and sometimes it's because you didn't even know that you had it, then that's what Rambam said, you're a fool. You're a fool. But also, if you know it and you don't use it, then you're wicked. You're wicked because why don't you? And then on top of that, you're an arrogant because on top of that, you said, ah, I don't need to. I don't have to. I know better. So, yeah. Let's see. I have comments here. Ruvain, you say the judges were long ago by the time of Rabbi, Nat Rabbi Nathan. Yes, 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 of course. But we are talking about not those judges, the biblical judges. We are talking about judges in general, in every generation. You know, the, the judges that you have today in the 21st century. Uh, and Denise, you say, we can't make assumptions. We had to parse out our judgments or decision before we make them. Yeah, but you said, basically, Rambam said, you know, take your time. Take your time to think. That's why God blessed you with a brain. That's it. We have it there. So if you don't, if you don't engage in that because uh, you know better, then it's, it, that's, that's arrogance. A little bit of arrogance sometimes. So, uh, yeah. Let's continue. One more text about this. One more text about this. Rabbi Yonah, it says, one who is quick to render a judicial decision, even though he meant to speak the truth, is not an ined inadvertent sinner. Rather, he is considered almost as one who acts intentionally. He should have taken the heart to heart that the hearts of the hasty do not understand wisdom. An axiom which points out that people are prone to err. True. This is what our sages meant when they said, be meticulous in study, for a careless misinterpretation is considered tantamount of willful transgression. Uh, by taking more time for reflection, one may become aware of the new aspects and approaches which his initial thought did not yield. This, this is gold. Let me read it again. By taking more time for reflection, one may become aware of new aspects and approaches which his initial thoughts did not yield. That's what sometimes, you know, when you have to make, make decisions, people will sometimes give you the advice and say that sleep sleep on it take a day take a day don't don't, don't answer now because you may be you may be aware of things that you don't realize right away you need to take time to think a little bit more think it regarding this king solomon said if you see a person who thinks he's wise there is more hope for a fool than for him. It's like when you say, all, all I know is I know nothing. You know, it's, it's, so one who is wise in his, in his own eyes sees no need to learn, consult with others, or reconsider. The fool, on the other hand, may at least be aware of his deficient knowledge. For him, there is yet hope. Wonderful. A wonderful thing. So... Uh, one of the things is uh, for judging, for judging, or for making better decisions, you need to study. And you need to study constantly. That's the point. And that's why it's not a coincident that the coincidence that the next statement is raise up many disciples, many students. You see how the judgment part connects with the learning and teaching part. So listen to this. This is from the Talmud. I forgot the, the, uh, the quote. I didn't put it there. Oh. The, the Academy of Shammai, remember Hillel and Shammai, the big rabbis, they were Zugot, right before, they, they, before the time of the, of the Mishnah. 
Okay. The Academy of Shammai said a Torah teacher should teach only one who is wise and humble and who comes from a good family. Wow. The Academy of Hillel said, teach all, teach all. For there have been many sinners among the Jews who were brought near to Torah study and emerge as righteous, pious, and upstanding persons. Wonderful. So, when it says rise up many disciples, of course we follow the recommendation of the Academy of Hillel. That we believe that there is value in Torah to transform a life. To transform a life. And yes, of course, we always prefer if we can approach Torah with study now. You, know, you prepare from Pesach to Shavuot. So you approach Shavuot, you approach Revelation with a pure heart. So you can uh, receive the Torah in a different way. Fantastic. Sometimes that's not realistic. And uh, it doesn't matter. What basically what Hill said, even if you didn't have the opportunity or, I don't know, you made a bad decision and you didn't engage on all this uh, perfection of your traits of character before you study Torah. Still, a teacher, a mentor can guide you through Torah to become a better person. That's why everybody should be welcome to study Torah. Because you never know when sometimes one word, one teaching, one class can change your life. And it's true. It happened to me. One book of Torah can change your life. So uh, it's, it's, it, the more we engage, the better chance that we have to find that gold that speaks to us in Torah. We have comments here. Uh, Denise, you say, it's like buying a home. Will you buy the first home you see? Why would you make a snap judgment or decision? No, you have to do like a, you know the, the, the show, sometimes I watch it, I like, uh, what is it? House Hunters International. Do you watch that one? If you do, let me know in the chat. It's lots of fun. They always choose between three homes before, before they make a decision. And it's, a, uh, it's funny, they probably say more than three. More than three. I can't believe that somebody can choose a home just by looking at three houses. <laughs> I never done that. But yes, a home it's it's a major thing. It's a major thing. That's why I remember something that uh uh the my former rabbi from Chile taught me once that uh he was saying that you have to be you have to pay attention to the small decisions. Listen to this, listen to this guy, this is golden. Because this is one of the things that I've told you before. Words of wisdom then change my approach of life. He said to me, be careful with the small decisions. Because the big decisions take care of themselves. Like if you want to buy a house, of course you're going to think about it. But there are so many other things, little things, that we say, ah, it's nothing. Ah, it's nothing. But this piles up. And it's it, it's interesting. Think about that. Be careful of the small decisions because the big decisions take care of themselves. Okay, Denise, you said yes. Very addictive. Yeah, <laughs> it's an addictive show. It's fun. It's fun, even though it's probably lots of fake things there, but nevertheless, it's entertaining. Okay, so let's continue here. Uh, Soloviechik, Joseph Soloviechik, he said, even if one developed disciples while young, he should develop many disciples, continuing to teach even into old age the sense that never stop Torah study never stop you may retire from a job but you don't retire from Torah study uh, as Karen you said a stitch in time saves nine never heard that never heard that interesting stitch in time saves nine okay wow uh okay so and let me see one more thing here and this is the interesting one i was talking about it's not just studying and teaching teaching and studying this is the word that put it all together from the talmud and after this we are going to continue with putting offense to the torah otherwise we won't have time rabbi hanina said 
Listen to this, because this is the way I feel every time I teach a class. Okay? Rabbi Hanina said, I have learned much from my teachers. And from my colleagues, more than from my teachers. And from my students, more than from them all. And that's why I love your comments, guys. Because this is a way for me to learn from you. Every comment makes me think. And that's something that I cannot tell about many things of my life, that they actually make me think. So it's a good way. That's why I love to see all these uh, comments that you write here. Uh, Karen, you say here, so if you take care of, uh, of things when they are small, they won't become big. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I agree with that. So let's go to the, to the last thing. Make a fence for the Torah. Okay, so this is, again, this is a preventive legislation. So defense of the Torah, this is something that you take precautions before you have the problem. You decide it before you have the problem. So let me read this. Preventive legislation is something needed in order to keep one from violating Torah prohibitions. Okay? This concept is familiar in many areas of activity. For example, a government will enact a margin of safety in regulating the weight limits carried by airlines or the dosage of potentially harmful drugs. Thus, the sages prohibited certain marriages to prevent possible incest and forbade certain activities on the Sabbath, such as muktzah the handling of certain utensils, lest one use them to perform a labor proscribed by the Torah. Uh, so you know what is muksa? This I like this. Muksa is, for example, on Shabbat you're not allowed, you're not allowed to write. Right? You cannot write. So in other words, if you cannot write, why would you carry a pencil? <laughs> so the rabbi said you're not allowed to carry a pencil. Is there anything that violates the Shabbat on a pencil? No, there is not. But pencils are used for writing, mainly. Of course, you can use it for, I don't know, you can use it to scratch your scalp or your back sometimes, I guess. <laughs> but it's considered muksa, it's forbidden, because the main reason pencils are in, were invented is to write, and writing is forbidden on Shabbat. So that is a perfect example of a fence, for uh, the fence around the Torah. So... The enactment of such cautionary rules is scripturally mandated. Why? Because Leviticus says, You shall safeguard my charge or my law, which the sages interpret as make a safeguard for my charge. Make it. Create fences around the Torah, which I know, I know it seems to be in contradiction when there is another verse that it says, You shall not add not subtract from the Torah. There is a such there is such a verse. And that was a big controversy between rabbis and Karaites. And that's why the sect of Karaites rejected the oral law. They believe there is a violation of the Torah commandment that said you should not add anything to the Torah. But that's for another day. Okay? But the rabbis understand that defenses are very important. Very, very important. Well, Shelley, welcome to the class. You're late, but you can al always remember everybody. You can always catch the rebroadcast of the class tonight at 8 p.m. Central Time, okay? So, more about this. Even though the main prohibition of, for, for example, remember the story of Nazarite? Uh, you can, it's in the Torah. The Nazarite is a person who decided, for many reasons, that they will not drink wine or they will not cut their hair or they will not get close to a corpse. Three prohibitions, Nazarite, most famous Samson. Remember the story of Samson? Okay, so even though the main prohibition of a Nazarite is the drinking of wine, the Torah forbids him from partake of anything similar to wine. The Torah uses this as an example to teach the sages how to fulfill their mandate to safeguard the Torah's law. In other words, the Torah, the, the rabbis take the story of the Nazarite and they apply concept of uh, similarity, or how do you call it? Analogy. Analogy. 
Okay, you learn the principle behind the story, and you apply the same principle to other parts of the Torah. So that's the the rule that they're using here. It's an analogy. Using the prohibition of a Nazarite as a prototype, the sages forbade various acts in order to prevent one from transgressing the Torah prohibition. The Torah provides this model in order to show that it is the will of God that the sages erect fences around the Torah. Ruvain, you say, uh, were there many rabbis and others who disagreed with the prohibition of writing on Shabbat? Just think what ideas were lost due to prohibition, especially on Shabbat. Yeah, uh, I, I think they were pretty uh, unanimous about the prohibition, about, about that thing. I think they were pretty unanimous. Okay, yeah. Uh, and yes, there, there were people in history, there were people in history, listen to this, that uh, they trained themselves to listen to uh, rabbi sermons on Shabbat, they will memorize them, and as soon as Shabbat was over, they will transcribe them by memory. I know as a fact, for example, that uh, the one who had such a helpers was the Lubavitcher Rebbe. They had people who actually would memorize his uh, words of Torah on Shabbat, and as soon as Shabbat was over, they will write it, but the 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 writing was, was pretty unanimous. Absolutely. Pretty unanimous. Um, so, and I have one more text for you guys here. Back to Rabbi Wayne. And he said, the sages, but th th this is what uh, Karen, Karen, you were, you were saying something like this about the difficulties of this commandment, right? The sages exercise great wisdom and balance. But this is, I think that's the word, balance, right? in instituting such ordinances, and they cautioned against adding to what they imposed. The Midrash teaches that erecting fences capriciously can be counterproductive. Okay? I, I, that's the thing. And that's what I, I believe that many people are feeling towards Judaism. When they, they We see so many restrictions and then we realize that many of the restrictions are not original restrictions, are just fences or a restriction on top of the restrictions. And sometimes it's a restriction on top of the restriction of the restriction, what they call the humbra. I don't know if you ever heard that word, the humbra. That is people that they, uh, they make a decision to observe Judaism in a super stringent way. They make that decision, always to take the more stringent stringent approach to everything. Like the people who will drink not just kosher milk, but halav Israel, which is not only kosher, but it was produced by a Jew, and things like that, which is a, uh, yeah. Uh, so why is there, Karen, you said, what is there, let's see, a restriction of men and women sitting together in some synagogues. Well, I, I can talk about that. Uh, the thing is, and, and you probably heard this, and you said that's sexist, and you're absolutely right, that the women are a destruction to men. That was was another uh, another prohibition, even when men and women were already separated, that women cannot sing publicly right so why is it so you say well but if women are a, are a destruction for men maybe men are a destruction for women well but this is the thing this is the thing this is the rabbinic logic uh but some rabbinic logic that's why conservative reform synagogues we don't have that anymore okay but let me explain what is the original rationale here the original rationale is look look men have the obligation to pray one of their commandments is to show up at synagogue and pray morning, afternoon, and evening. Women don't have that obligation, at least not originally. Okay? So if men have the obligation and women are a distraction, so then you have to do something so these men can fulfill with their obligation. If there was no obligation, then there would be no need of any kind of separation. Okay, so that is, yeah, it's a fence. It's a fence to protect the ability of men 
to fulfill their obligation, okay? Uh, yeah, so Denise, you say in Chabad in Austin, Texas, they dive in that way. I don't agree that for myself. For them, it makes sense. Yeah, because they, they really believe that men has obligation, women don't. Women, according to traditional halacha, don't have any obligation to fulfill any mitzvah that is time time sensitive. So because you have to pray morning, afternoon, and evening is time specific, time sensitive. So women don't have the obligation, but men do. That's their rationale. Okay? That's their rationale. So let's continue with this. And uh, let me explain what happened here and how we have to be very careful not to exaggerate. This rabbi is making a pitch against exaggerations of the defenses around the Torah. We have to be very careful. So Adam's wife Eve in the Garden of Eden embellish upon God's commandments not to eat from the tree of knowledge and told the serpent that she was not allowed even to touch the tree. The serpent thereupon pushed her against it and pressed her. Nothing happened. The serpent thus proved to her that eating the tree's fruit would also bring forth no untoward results, and the rest is history. Do you understand that? This is very interesting. So basically what happened is when you start exaggerating, uh, and then all of a sudden nothing makes sense anymore. And that's why And th there were many things that they were added um, a long history. One was the, the, the prohibition of men and women together comes from beginning of rabbinic history. But the prohibition of singing, it was more modern. The prohibition of women singing in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a place where men can listen to their voices. That was added later on. That was added later on. So, and uh, other fences. Let me think about different examples of fences. The prohibition of eating uh, bird meat with milk. It's a fence. It's a fence. So we won't uh, violate the biblical commandment of the beef with milk. The fact that we start Shabbat 18 minutes before it actually starts. Same thing. It's a little fence. So if you're a little late, don't worry. You st you're still not violating Shabbat. You know what I mean? It's a buffer. So sometimes fences make sense. Sometimes, at least for us, they don't. Okay? So, thank you everyone for uh, for coming to the class today. Uh, I hope you feel a little bit more prepared for Shavuot because it's happening even if you are not ready. It's happening this weekend. Shavuot starts Saturday night. Okay? So the tradition of Saturday night is to attend the tikkun. We study all night. Unfortunately, this year we don't have anything prepared like that in Winnipeg. But if you can find something online, I will guarantee. I, I will. I will ask you to join a group that they actually study all night. It's a very special experience, which I recommend to everyone. But then we have at the Shari Zedek Temple Shalom together Sunday 2 p.m. Sunday 2 p.m. The uh, rabbi's panel with myself and Rabbi Alan Finkel from Temple Shalom talking about revelation, our, our interpretation of the revelation of Torah. Rabbi Finkel will talk more about the revelation of the written Torah. I will talk about, I will talk more about the oral Torah and rabbinic Judaism in general. Uh, Karen Farkas, you said uh friday night or saturday night saturday night is uh saturday night is shavuot and then sunday first day of shavuot and monday morning monday morning is iskor service at charizetic is at 7 30 a.m iskor around nine and sunday morning is going to be at 9 a.m at charizetic for the first day of shavuot so check out our website, it's at winnipeg.ca. For more details, you can visit also our Facebook page for more details. Please give it a thumbs up. Come on, everybody hit the thumbs up for this video. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel. We have great things going on all the time. And if you don't want to miss a bit, subscribe and hit the bell so you will be notified every time we go live. 
or every time we upload something to our channels. This class is going to be restreamed tonight at 8.30 p.m. Uh, sorry, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Central Time. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and in advance, Shabbat Shalom, Chag Sameach. Hope to see you soon. Bye, everyone.